Northwest Valley Christian Church, Pastor Rob here, and we are so glad that you are joining us online. We can't wait to hear from Pastor John today on uh, um, continuing in this series, Gone Fishing. But uh, I am asking that you would prepare your hearts right now for our special time of worship and the word that's going to be brought by Pastor John, and that you would leave uh, today's services better than you came. And I pray that you been will be encouraged and filled uh, to the brim with uh, all of God's wonderful grace, mercy, and knowledge. God bless you, and uh, we will see you again. How's it going, West Valley Christian Church? Excited to be here doing worship with you guys. Let's all stand if you're at home. Let's stand. Let's clap our hands. I know we might not be in the church, but we are the church. So let's have a good time. Let's sing out. You call into darkness. Sing this out, every tribe, every tongue. Every tribe, every tongue, every heart will sing. Every knee we will bow to the risen King. Lift Him up, lift Him up, never gonna stop singing. Oh, never gonna stop. Every tribe, every tongue, every heart will sing. Every knee we will bow to the risen King. Lift him up, lift him up, never gonna stop singing. Ooh, never gonna stop. Higher, higher, hearts burning bright like a fire, fire. Voices unite, make it louder, louder. Never gonna stop singing. Ooh, never gonna stop. Higher, higher, hearts burning bright like a fire. Voices unite, make it louder, louder. Never gonna stop singing. Ooh, never gonna stop singing. Yeah. Amen. Well, let's continue to lift up the name of Jesus. Would you just continue to join in and sing with us as we sing worthy? Yeah. 
It was my cross you bore So I could live In the freedom you died for And now my life is yours And I will sing Of your goodness Jesus, you deserve praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Jesus, you deserve
you in this place. There is none like you, God. Be exalted in the heavens. May your glory, God, be on display. Lord, we thank you for your presence. God, we thank you that you are present here with us right now. God, we just invite your spirit to fall on us. We thank you, Lord, that we can meet you wherever we are, whether we're in our homes or whether we're in our cars or outside. It doesn't matter. God, you are there. Lord God, I just pray that you would just embolden your church, God, to be courageous, to lift up your name in all that we do, God, that we would be so bold to pray for the salvation of our neighbors, for the salvation of those around us, Lord God. God, we thank you that you even choose to use us for your glory, for your purposes, that the world may know who Jesus is, that the world may know the salvation that we have in Jesus, that the world may know true joy, true hope, true faithfulness, it is in you and you alone that we find wholeness, that we find restoration, that we find true joy for our souls. God, would you restore anyone today that is feeling lonely, that is feeling all alone, that is feeling out of place, that has maybe lost step with you. God, would you restore them back to you? God, we thank you that you pick us up when we fall. Lord, we are never too far from your reach. God, I pray that we would go wherever you would call us to go. That we would do whatever you would call us to do in your name. We thank you, God, for loving us. Lord, give us the courage. Give us the faith to trust in you more. The great unknown where feet may fail, and there I find you in the mystery in oceans deep. My faith will stand. So I.
I love the title of our sermon series, Gone Fishing, and yet I have to tell you honestly, I'm not really a big fan of fishing. Uh, maybe one day I'd love to go fishing in Alaska with my sons and, and catch some halibut and catch some salmon, but, but aside from that, not really interested in fishing all that much. And, and to be honest with you all, there's only one person to blame for my lack of joy in fishing, my father. Now, I just want you all to know this, I want you to know this before I say anything bad about my father, that I love my father, okay? But my father pretty much ruined fishing for me. Uh, matter of fact, he, he was a fisherman when, when we were young, but the only thing he ever caught was salmon when he went to a restaurant. And, and so I tease him about being bad luck on the water. And I remember going on camping trips and fishing trips and just catching nothing, you know. And, and I believe his bad luck has been passed down to generations uh, in our family. And, and you know what? It isn't just the lack of production over the years of fishing with my dad that drove me away. But I have to be honest, I was scarred by a family fishing trip when I was young in life. I, I don't really remember how old I was. I, I would say I was probably early elementary. And we were going fishing. It was my dad, my older brother and sister, and my Uncle Alan. And we were going out on, uh, I think it's called a jetty. So we were walking out on these rocks to where they wanted to fish. And, and I got to be honest with you. I was in early elementary school. And if I remember correctly, I was wearing flip-flops. Who lets their child go fishing on a jetty wearing flip-flops? But anyway, my dad did. And, and so I'm walking out on this jetty towards where we were going to fish. And I remember thinking I was going to fall to my death. You know, these sharp rocks were just going to slice me open. And so we're out there, and we're fishing, and we're not catching anything. And, and, and again, I was young, so I don't really know how long it was. But, but it seemed like hours we were out there fishing. And so I begin to get hungry, and I begin to get thirsty. But there's only one problem. My dad and my uncle were in charge of packing the cooler. And there were only two things that were packed inside that cooler. Bait and beer. Okay? They packed bait and they packed beer. I was a little too young to be drinking the beer. And the worms didn't really interest me in nourishment. And so I remember sitting there forever as, as they're still fishing and I'm just miserable. And, and at some point, I'm so hungry and I'm so thirsty that I begin to start throwing up all over the rocks of this jetty. And so it was at that point that my dad and my uncle finally decided to wrap things up and to get us out of there. And so I remember going back to my grandma and grandpa's house uh, in Torrance, and I remember feeling like I was going to die. So is there any wonder why I'm not really interested in fishing to this day? Thanks, Dad. So if you look through the Gospels, unlike my dad, Jesus was quite a fisherman. Uh, he, he was great at catching fish, but he was even better at being a fisher of men. And, and it may not work with people, um, but, but if, you're gonna, if you're going to catch fish, uh, and I only know this because others have told me this, I've not experienced this in my own life, but if you're going to have success fishing, it's something you want to do early in the day. If you remember two weeks ago in the first sermon, uh, the pastor Rob preached on this. He told the story of going fishing and leaving at like midnight to get out to the good spot. And so Jesus kind of lived that in his own life. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, it says this, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And so more important than Jesus' secret on how to fish, this verse kind of gives us his secret to prayer. He got up early. Like he got up early and went and prayed before anything else could get in the way. It says that he went to a solitary place. He went somewhere where he could be alone, somewhere that he could pray and not be distracted by other things going on all around him. And it says, and then he prayed. And so today, as we look at Scripture, we're going to be talking about prayer. And I'm going to begin by saying this. I believe that God is in the business of answering prayers. Amen. The Bible is filled with answered prayers. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to give you just a quick run through of a bunch of answered prayers that we see in Scripture. In Exodus chapter 3, the Israelites are being oppressed by the Egyptians, and it says that their, their prayers reach God. God hears their prayers because of their oppression. And so God sends them Moses and Aaron to deliver them from the hands of the Egyptians. After they've been delivered, in Exodus chapter 17, they're wandering you know, out, out after leaving Egypt, and, and there's no water for them to drink. 
And so Moses prays to God, and God causes water to come out of a rock to quench their thirst. Um, in Joshua chapter 10, it tells us that Joshua is fighting the, the Amorite kings, and it says that he prays to God, and the sun stood still so that he could defeat, defeat those Amorite kings. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 19 through 25, we read the story of David, and it says in there that he inquires of the Lord concerning his going to battle with the Philistines, and God says yes. Interesting thing is you read some of the things of the, that the kings of the Old Testament did. Quite often when you read that they inquired of the Lord, they were successful when they inquired of the Lord. When they did things without inquiring of the Lord, that's quite often when they were unsuccessful. And in 1 Kings chapter 17, we read about Elijah, and it says in there that he prayed, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And then it says that he prayed again, and it did rain. Also in that chapter of 1 Kings chapter 17, it talks about Elijah praying for a widow's son. This widow's son had passed away, and this widow's son is brought back to life. Interesting thing about these stories with Elijah, James tells us that we're to pray. And then he says Elijah was a man just like us. He's saying, hey, there's nothing special about him. Sounds like there might have been a little something special about Elijah and his prayer life. Because in 1 Kings chapter 18, we have a battle between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And they're going to pray to their gods to see whose God is real. And so if you read 1 Kings chapter 18, you see that the, the prophets of Baal are praying for hours. And they're running around and they're agitated and they're trying to get the attention of their God. And nothing happens. And as a matter of fact, if you read 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah even kind of begins to mock them because the, pro the God of Baal isn't answering and so as Elijah is sitting there getting ready to pray to God, you know, the, the, God, the, the God is going to take care of this sacrifice of Elijah. And he's saying, hey, pour water on it, okay? And so then when Elijah prays, fire comes, and that sacrifice is burnt up. God is answering prayer. In 2 Kings chapter 4, Elisha, not to confuse with Elijah, Elisha prays, and the Shunammite son is brought back to life. Second Kings chapter 20, we read that Hezekiah learns that he is terminally ill, he's going to die, and he prays to God, and God says, listen, I'm going to give you an additional 15 years of life. In Daniel chapter 2, verses 17 through 18, Daniel's life is on the line because Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream, and no one can interpret it, and his life is on the line, and so Daniel prays to God, help me to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. God hears him. And Daniel is able to interpret the dream. And so as we come into the New Testament, a passage that Pastor Rob looked at last week in, in many of the Gospels, but in Mark chapter 6, we read of Jesus taking a few fish and a few loaves and praying to, to his Father in heaven. And it tells us that 5,000 men were fed that day. In Luke chapter 1, we read the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And, and Zechariah prays for, for him and his wife to be able to have a child. And God answers his prayer with the birth of John the Baptist. In Acts chapter 9, we read that Peter prays, and another person who is dead, Tabitha, this young girl who'd passed away, is raised back to life. In Acts chapter 12, Peter has been put in prison, and, and we read that the church is praying for him, and God miraculously releases Peter from prison, and he goes to where the disciples are. And they don't even believe that it's really him. You know, like he's knocking on the door like, let me in. And they can't believe that it's really him. But God has answered their prayer. One last prayer that I want to mention right here before we move on is, is found um, in Luke chapter 22. Jesus, and this one's a little different than the other ones. But Jesus is on the path to the cross. And he prays for his father's will to be done. He's not looking forward to the cross. And we're going to come back to this verse a little later in the message and yet he prays, not my will, but yours be done. And so in having shared all of those incredible examples of prayer in the Bible, there's something else that I need to mention right here as we begin talking about prayer today. Is you know what? Sometimes when we pray, God's answer is no. Like sometimes God says yes, and sometimes God says no. Sometimes God even says maybe wait. And the difficulty for us is that we always want God to say yes to our prayers. And when he says no, and he says wait, we don't really understand. And, and, and to be honest with you, I don't understand that sometimes. 
I, I don't know why sometimes the answer is no and sometimes the answer is wait, but I know that my job is simply to pray. And, and so before we spend some time talking about what I think I've learned about prayer, I, I want to share a few more verses about prayer that I think are really key for us to remember. And one of them is actually a verse that I've already mentioned, Mark 1.35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus is the Son of God, and yet he needed to go spend time with his Father. If Jesus needed to pray, doesn't it make sense that you and I need prayer? Like, think about it. If the Savior of the world needed to get up early to go pray to his Father, how much more do we, us fallen sinners, need to be making sure that we are spending time in prayer with our Father. Prayer is essential for us to have a spirit-filled, godly life. It, it isn't possible without it. It isn't optional. Jesus got up early. But the truth is, it doesn't matter when we pray. You could pray early, you could pray late, and hopefully we're praying all throughout the day in between. You know, like it's great to have an early prayer time, just in a quiet place to pray, but hopefully as we're living our lives, we are having a daily conversation, a run-in conversation with the Lord about everything that we're facing and everything that we're doing. Uh, the second verse that I want you to think about this morning or today is, is 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 10 through 16. And, and this is kind of a complicated story because it's the story of Hannah and Hannah's husband Elkanah has a second wife. Um, and, and so in the story, we read that this other wife has children, but Hannah has not had any children, and it's a sore spot for her. And as a matter of fact, it says in, the, in that passage that Elkanah, her husband, loved her very much, but the other wife would provoke Hannah. Like she, was, she would do things to purposely irritate her. And so Hannah's heartbroken that she hasn't been able to have any children. She's heartbroken that she hasn't been able to conceive, and so she prays to the Lord. And this is what... 1 Samuel chapter 1 says, it says, In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. She's praying and she's so upset. Words aren't even coming out of her mouth, and someone thinks that she's drunk. But really what she's doing is she is praying to the Lord. She is laying out her prayers to the Lord. And we know from the story that God hears her prayer and gives her that son, Samuel. And he goes on to be a great man of God. And there's, there's so many lessons for us to learn from Hannah. But one of the things that I want us to understand, and it's so important for us today, is this. As you know it, in our anguish, God hears us. Like, it doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what the struggles you're going through. Is that as we struggle and as we're pouring out our heart to the Lord and however we do that, I want you to know that God hears you. God can hear you and he knows what's going on and he cares. And so sometimes as we're going through life, we feel like we're alone. We feel like people don't understand. We feel like people don't just care about what's going on. And I want you to understand as you are pouring out your soul to the Lord that he truly cares about you that our Heavenly Father hears us. He doesn't always promise to do what we want. Hannah was given a son, Samuel. And like I mentioned earlier, we're not all, the, the, the answer to our prayer is not always yes, but we can trust that he is there and that he is listening. The, the next verse that I, I want to draw your attention to is found in Daniel chapter 6. And, and the life of Daniel is a, is a story that as Christians we, we talk about a lot. And, and people know this story, but, and so we're familiar with him. But a short version in this chapter of Daniel chapter 6 is this. He's one of the administrators for Nebuchadnezzar. And, and matter of fact, he's probably Nebuchadnezzar's favorite administrator because what he does is blessed. And so these other guys were jealous of Daniel. And so they set up a trap to catch him. They, they went to Nebuchadnezzar and appealed to his pride. 
and said, hey, let's make it a law that no one is to pray to anyone or any God other than you for the next 30 days. And so Daniel chapter 6, verse 10 says this. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Several things really stand out to me from this verse. But first of all is this. Our priority is always going to be to obey God and not men. You know, the Bible tells us that we are to submit to our governing authorities. But as we think of this story, the law that was passed to only pray to Nebuchadnezzar would have been a violation of what Daniel knew to be God's will in his life. He knew that was a law that he could not obey. And, and you know, as Christians, this has been a subject that's been talked a lot uh, in these last couple months as, as people are talking about church and obeying stuff. And, and I don't really want to get sidetracked from the topic of prayer but our first priority is always going to be to be obedient to God's law. Amen. The second thing I want us to notice is that, you know what Daniel did? He went about praying like he usually did. He went to his room three times a day and he prayed. Um, notice there's a couple things that he didn't do. He didn't go to Nebuchadnezzar's palace and throw himself down in front of Nebuchadnezzar's palace and pray right there for everyone to see him. He wasn't throwing it in everybody's face that he was still praying. He went to his room like usual and prayed. And you know what? No matter what laws get passed, no one can stop us from praying. You know, I, I don't know if it's still something that, that people are talking about a lot, but for a long time, people were talking about school prayer and being able to pray in school. And you know what? As a pastor, you know, they didn't like me going on to school campuses and, and to do prayers. And you know what? I'm okay with that. I mean, I would love to be able to go on a campus and pray, but that, you know, it is what it is. But you know what? They can't take prayer out of school. Amen. As long as our children are going to school, they can pray. No one can stop them from praying. As a matter of fact, as long as there are tests that there are children that are unprepared for, there's going to be prayer in school. As a matter of fact, in some of these schools, maybe someone who's even an atheist who isn't ready for that test might occasionally throw up a prayer to the Lord above. And so no one can stop us from praying. And in all seriousness, there are lots of things that we can be told that we can or cannot do, but no one can stop us from praying. And my bigger concern for us as Christians is let's put ourselves in this story. If someone passed a law today that said we couldn't pray to anybody but to our governor for the next 30 days, my concern is this, is how many Christians would be completely unaffected by that law? If you weren't allowed to pray but to anybody but our governor for the next 30 days, how many people would be completely unaffected by that law? Daniel's habit was to pray three times a day, and the law against it wasn't going to affect anything or stop him. The next verse that I, I want to share with you today, and I think it's for me at least, it's one of the most important verses that's in this sermon. In Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. It says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Listen to this. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless, wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. What an incredible, incredible verse. Because you know what, so often I don't know what to pray. I don't know what the right answer is. And, and I love this verse because you may not feel like you know how to pray. You might feel uncomfortable praying. You may not feel comfortable praying in front of other people because you don't think you know all the right words. But this passage from Romans is saying, hey, listen, you don't need to worry about any of all that. Because as Christians, God has given us his Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And the way I look at that verse is like the Holy Spirit takes the gibberish and the nonsense that comes out of my mouth because he knows my heart and he presents that to our Father in heaven. It's like he takes my nonsense and he makes it understandable for our Father in heaven. I'm not even able to completely comprehend what that means. And yet I'm so grateful for the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives in prayer because that gives me great comfort. Because so often, like I said, I'm not sure what to say or how to say it. And yet the Holy Spirit helps us and guides us in that. 
So the last thing I want to do today is I, I want to finish by sharing three important things that I feel like I've learned about prayer. And, and I think they're important for every one of us as Christians to understand about prayer. The first thing I want us to understand is this, is that prayer is more about changing our minds to God's will than it is about changing God's will to ours. Amen. Do you understand that? Prayer is more about changing my mind to what God wants instead of changing God's mind to what I want. You know, foolishly, we often think that we know what is best for us. And the truth is, God knows what is best for us. And so our prayers ought to be more about, Lord, help me to accept your will in this situation. Lord, help me to be in line with what your will is, whatever is going on. And, and thankfully, I think there are lots of situations where my will and the Father's will are in line. But when we pray, it isn't just about what we want, because sometimes we're way off base. There are times when I have prayed for things, and as I look back in my life, I go, thank you, Lord, that you said no to me. Thank you, Lord, that you did not do what I wanted you to do, because that would have been the worst thing for me. And so in our prayers, I think it's okay for us to let God to know, or let God know what we would like to have happen. But we also have to leave room for God to do what he knows is best for us. And, and, you know, we learned that. I mentioned the passage earlier, but we learned that from Jesus himself. As Jesus is heading to the cross, he's just finished celebrating his last supper with the disciples. In Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 46, say this. It says, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw away from them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And a sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground, like he's seriously praying. When he rose from prayer and went back to his disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. From reading the other Gospels, we know that that prayer that Jesus says there in verse 42 is something that he prays more than once. He's on the verge of facing the cross, and, he, and he's like I said, he's talking to his father. He's basically saying, Dad, is there anything else that we can do? Is there any other way? And yet he knows that there isn't. But he's asking anyway, and his prayers can really teach us so much because the key words for us is, yet not my will, but yours be done. This is one of the most important things that we can learn about prayer because prayer is not about changing God's mind. It's about changing our mind. And so instead of trying to convince God of what you want to have happen, how about if we ask God for us to see and to accept his will? The second thing I want to mention about prayer is this, is that prayer prepares us for God's working. Prayer prepares us for God's working. Let me explain it by this. Two people can hear the same sermon. And if you ask two different people about the sermon, one might look at you and say, well, it was terrible. And, and this is what the pastor should have said. And this is what he said that was wrong. And this is where he should have gone with it. And then another person who heard the same sermon might sit there and go, well, I don't know about that. I thought that sermon was incredible. As a matter of fact, I felt like the pastor was talking directly to me. Now, remember, they heard the same sermon. What's different between the two? And, and I believe quite often the difference is in our preparation for experiencing God. One person wakes up and without any real conversation with God heads off to church. But another person wakes up and is grateful for the morning and begins a conversation with God that continues through the music and continues through everything that's going on during the sermon. One is prepared through prayer for God to move and the other one is prepared to go to lunch after church. One has a heart that's been softened by prayer and the other one doesn't. Now, for the record, let me just say this. I'm not blaming you every time you think that we preach a bad sermon. Matter of fact, I'm sure Rob and I preach more than our fair share of bad sermons. No need for an amen. amen. And we preach bad sermons more often than we would like. But even in the worst sermons that are ever preached, if our heart is ready and our heart is open to what God is trying to say, even in the worst of our sermons, God is able to reveal truth to us. In the moments when we prepared our hearts by prayer, we're able to learn something, even when it's not the pastor's best. 
I, I read this quote many years ago. As a matter of fact, I have a filing cabinet and I have a big old file on prayer, and I wrote this on the cover, okay? Some of you are young people, maybe ask your parents what a filing cabinet is. Um, but I, I read this quote probably 25 to 30 years ago, and I wrote it down. And it's from a rabbi. And this rabbi said this, says, when people come to my temple or a church or a mosque, they expect a spiritual experience. But I say, if they haven't done it on their own before they step into a sacred place, that place is going to be no more sacred than a library or a movie theater. Let me read that to you again. It says, when people come to my temple or a church or a mosque, they expect a spiritual experience. But I say, if they haven't done it on their own before they step into a sacred place, that place is going to be no more sacred than a library or a movie theater. When we're bathing everything that we do in prayer, we're much more likely to actually hear from God. When we're bathing everything that we do in prayer, we're much more likely to respond to the challenges of our life the way God wants us to do, or he wants us to respond. Prayer prepares us and softens our hearts and our minds and gets us ready for what God has in store for us. And so even when challenges are thrown at us, we're able to respond to them the way God wants us to. And so prayer is more about changing our mind and not God's mind. Prayer is also a way to prepare us for God's working. And and lastly, I want to just say this, that, that prayer reminds us about what is most important. Prayer reminds us about what is most important. When you look at Jesus' teaching on prayer in the Gospels, Jesus isn't really ever talking about some really difficult things. Most of his teaching is very simple to understand. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15, Jesus says this, says, When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go in your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans. That's one of my favorite lines in the whole Bible. Do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we've also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then Jesus says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. In those first few verses, Jesus is telling us about prayer. And he's saying, listen, prayer isn't supposed to be a show. We're not supposed to be trying to impress other people with our prayers. We're we're just communicating with God. He's telling us, listen, just because you use a lot of words, it doesn't mean that God is going to hear that. Like, that should be encouraging to us. That prayer isn't the show for other people. And it's not like we're going to wear down God with our many words. You know, sometimes we use 50 words when 10 will do especially in our conversations with the Lord. And if you were to look at that same section in Luke, chapter 11, matter of fact, Jesus, Luke is telling us about the Lord's Prayer. He's saying that he's, Jesus starts teaching that because the disciples have asked him, hey, teach us to pray. And so Jesus' prayer is rather simple. It's not very complex. Prayer is about honoring our Father in heaven. We're here to lift him up and to praise him as we pray. Jesus prays for the Father's will to be done. We've already talked about that. That should be an important part of our prayers. That our Father, not our will, but his will be done. He tells us to pray for our daily bread. Not our daily wants, not our daily excesses, but to pray for our daily bread. Then he talks and he's reminding us to pray about forgiveness. Because we need to be forgiven. Just as we want God to avoid, or we want God to forgive us. And then lastly, he prays tells us to pray that we could uh, avoid temptation. That's not, a, that's not a complex, that's not a difficult prayer. And Jesus is reminding us about what is most important in our lives. And so we get caught up in so many other things that don't matter at all. And yet we get so out of place chasing after things that don't matter at all. And so Jesus' prayer is a prayer of a reminder of what is most important and what our prayers ought to be like. You know, our series has gone fishing. 
and I may never be a successful fisherman. You may not ever be a successful fisherman or fisherwoman. But we can all be successful in prayer. We don't have to learn fancy words. It doesn't matter what position you're sitting in. If you're on the ground, if you're in a chair, if you're laying in your bed, it doesn't matter. God hears it, and he understands it all. And so for my hope for us today would that we would be allow our prayer life to change us, to change our mind, to change our will. My final encouragement to us would be this, just to do it. Don't worry about everything else, but just simply to do it. Simply pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your encouragement. Well, Lord, we thank you for the answered prayer that we see in the Bible. And yet most importantly, Lord, I thank you for, for the heart of Jesus that we see in his prayer, not my will, but your will be done. And I pray that that would be at the heart of every prayer that we pray. Thank you, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we've come to a time of communion, and this reminds me of miracles. Not earth-shattering ones and uh, parting of the Red Sea or things like that, but kind of small miracles. See, in my life, I don't think in terms of God coming in and parting the Red Sea for me. I think of things that maybe seemed as small miracles. And it makes me think of communion because when we look at that, it's a it's a simple thing. It's taking a piece of bread and a glass of juice. But, but this was a miracle. This was a small miracle that was huge over time. The disciples thought this was powerful. It meant something to them. So that even 20 years later, Paul was telling people about this night. In the book of Corinthians, Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread... And drink this cup. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This small act represents the biggest miracle in the world. This small act represents the fact that we were made right before God because of Christ's death. And every time we take it, we proclaim that miracle over and over again throughout creation itself. That sin was broken that death no longer has a hold, that we are forgiven and we are right with God. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this gift that you've given us. You are amazing. You have given us life. Lord, may that resound through our lives every day. May we proclaim your gospel because of that. You are God. Thank you. In your name, amen. We've come to a time of offering. This is a time for our members on our regular tenders to give back what God has given to them. Over my shoulder, you can see the different ways that you can send money in. This money is being used all over the world. There's a church in Kenya right now that is being built because of parts of this money. There are homeless in this valley that are being fed because of parts of this money. There are ways that this money is being used to show God's love to this world all over the place, and you at West Valley are part of that. Let's pray. God, thank you for your generosity, Lord, and may we be generous back. May we give what you've given to us 
And Father, may you take that money and change this world. Praise your name. Thank you. Amen. Hi everyone, I'm Kara, a member here at West Valley Christian Church where we exist to love God and love people. And here are your announcements. The men's breakfast is next Saturday. Men of West Valley on September 5th, you can pick up a great meal packed by the West Valley Iron Chefs between 8 and 8.30 a.m. And log on to the WebEx at 9 to hear a great speaker and enjoy great fellowship. Life groups are going strong and growing. We want every person at West Valley Christian Church to be able to experience the community and growth of our weekly life groups. We are still meeting on Zoom and have plenty of room for more to join. Please contact John Stahlberger at john at wvcch.org. And those are all the announcements I have for you today. If you're new to us, we are so glad you decided to visit and we would love for you to make West Valley your church home. Have a great week. Hey, I hope you enjoyed today's service and what Pastor John had to say on the topic of prayer. And it would be my encouragement, as it is for the entire staff, that we're about uh, transformation and not just information. So I pray that your prayer week uh, would be amazing. Uh, and uh, we look forward to hearing and seeing what God is going to continue to do in your life. And uh, we would love to encourage you to join us on our lawn service at nine o'clock on Sundays. If you're ready, we're ready. But if that's not something you're comfortable with, continue online with us and we're going to continue our series, Gone Fishing. Well, I got to go fishing. You have a great week. God bless you.